Thanks for joining us. This is the Auto Guide Show brought to you by eBay Motors. I'm Mike and he is Kyle. Today we have a lot to cover, including a special guest from Mazda here to give us all the details on the CX-70 and how it came to be. In the news, an EV gets a price, another is teased, and a third one has a lot of power. We'll also cover reviews of the Genesis G70, BMW i4, Mercedes GLS, and Toyota Sequoia TRD Pro. But first, a word from our sponsor ebay motors is here for the ride your elbow grease fresh installs and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a driveway entirely its own brake kits led headlights whatever you need ebay motors has it and with the ebay guaranteed fit it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time every time or your money back plus at these prices you're burning rubber not cash keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply Okay, we're going to get started with the reviews we did this week, and we start with a big truck that's meant to go off-road that Kyle drove. Yes. Well, I guess not I a truck, it's an SUV. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's based on a truck. It's one of those few SUVs out there that still is truck-based. So we're talking about the 2024 Toyota Sequoia TRD Pro. It is big. It looks aggressive. I think it looks pretty cool, to be honest with you. Yeah, it, it, it looks awesome, especially in that color. I saw it at the Toyota lot. Uh, I can't remember a couple weeks ago, and I thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and it and it sounds good too, right? That that Toyota, the new Turbo V6. I know some people are sad because it lost a V8, but honestly, it sounds good, and the piped in music kind of sounds like a V8. So you know what? I'm I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's how was it as a daily cool. driver? Uh, as a daily, it was interesting. It was a weird week. I mean, we haven't had much of a winter yet, but we did get a bunch of slush and foggy days and. You know, like a, a snowfall for 12 hours and then disappeared. And in that, uh, at this rolling on all terrains, not the greatest uh, in the slush. But once that was gone, it was actually it was surprisingly friendly on the road. Because you expect this to be great off-road. And I did take it around some trails. And of course, it's a blast there. But it's pretty good on the road, too, which matters, right? Because, I mean, no matter... Pretty much anyone who's buying this they're still going to be spending a decent amount of time driving it on public roads and so it's good that it has solid manners there i mean it moves around a lot but you still know what it's doing it's hard to see out of admittedly because it's so huge and for someone who lives in a big city with underground parking that requires a lot of planning ahead uh i've talked about this on a few previous episodes that we moved and our overhead parking does not work with the sequoia or rather it does because i literally walked it with a tape measure to double check but if you have if you have to park underground just be careful because this thing's about six eight oh i have a defender right now and on the menu screen one of the quick app buttons is dimensions so you can see how tall it is trying to fit it in places like that i thought hey that's a cool but um when we drove the regular sequoia hybrid about a year ago now um we had complaints about the ride. Is it better with the TRD and with the off-road suspension? I found that it was. We had, I want to say, the capstone when we drove, which really should seem like it would ride better on road. There's also a prototype, um, too, I remember. That's true, yeah. So I really, I mean, it it, it does ride a little truckish. It has a, a, a live rear axle, um, but never... It was never unruly and it never did anything unexpected. Um, you go into it expecting it to ride like a truck and it drives like a truck. And so I I really liked it. I didn't love certain aspects of it that I can probably say for a certain other car later in this uh, talk um, because I had both of them at the same time. But overall, I actually, I thought this was a lot of fun. I keep going back to, it kind of feels you feel family ties to the GR Corolla. And I know that sounds nuts because it's a hot hatch, but on a trail, this thing, like the steering is a little light, right? But once you're on a trail, it actually kind of takes on a life of its own and it becomes a really fun, very predictable and chuckable, huge vehicle. Cool. All right, so let's move on. You got to go on a trip to drive the refresh G70, which was already one of your favorite cars. So is it better? It is better. 
I will start by maybe getting one of the few bad things out of the way. Um, if you're looking for a sedan that comfortably fits adults in the back, the G70 is not it. It's still essentially a coupe in my mind, uh, which, you know, what, whatever, that's, that, that's fine. I hope Genesis isn't, isn't too mad at me for saying that. But the rest of it, the, the drive is just so well judged. And now they've got a, a much more powerful base engine. So it's, I'm pretty sure, the most powerful base engine in the class now at 300 horsepower, 311 pound feet of torque. And we drove every variation. We drove that and the V6, which sticks around. We drove them in both rear drive and all wheel drive forms. It still looks the same. And in my mind, that's great. I didn't need any changes. It looks excellent. There's some new wheel designs, which are nice and some new colors. Um, yeah, and it's it's just, it's still an affordable luxury vehicle. You want something that feels special inside. It's still fun to drive. It's surprisingly capable on the track. We drove the V6 rear drive models around there and it really does a, a good job and it's impressive. And it's not, it's not like it's a track, it's not an M3, right? It's not an M3 competitor, but it, it does really well there. And we did autocross in the four cylinder and that was a blast. Yeah, it would be up against the um, M340 uh, and the, well, Mercedes just changed all of their C-Class, so <laughs> it's hard to find one there. But yeah, like you said, the 300 horsepower is the entry-level engine. Most of the competitors are in the mid-200s, if that. So that that is a nice sort of power spot to be at, especially when it's probably a little more affordable, too. Absolutely, yeah. You're going to get a well-equipped four-cylinder, and it's got the, the additional power and at that price, you're looking at just getting in the door of the BMW. And I, honestly, I, I'd i be surprised if you could even get a decently specced Mercedes for that. Yeah. Speaking of BMW, <laughs> the next car you drove is the Electric 4 Series. Yes. So as I was hinting at earlier, this was one that I had at the same time as the Sequoia, which proved to be a really interesting comparison because i mean obviously no one's cross shopping these two vehicles uh despite them both being orange you'd think that that would automatically put them on the same short list uh, but the challenging thing with the sequoia is that it has a really high um load lip in the back in the tailgate and we've talked about this before when we've driven it and it's because of the hybrid setup so the battery's back there and so the seats are really high and when you fold them they're not flat so it becomes even higher to load stuff in whereas the bmw is a hatchback. I mean, it's a four-door or five-door, uh, but you pop the trunk, you fold the seats, and it is a huge load space. So the i4 is actually low-key a really great moving vehicle if you have to move items. But also, it's the the reason we wanted to drive this is it's it's the xDrive 40. It's new for this year, so you get the dual motor, but you don't have to go all the way up to the M50, which is fun and fast, but very pricey. So this one's a lot more affordable. 396 horsepower is still plenty quick. Yeah, oh, for sure. This so, is you. Um, yeah, this was based off the comparison we talked about last week where we had the Corolla hatch against the Impreza, which is only a hatch now. And we had the 2.5 RS, which is, um, depending on the country, top or near top trim. Uh, and it's one of the only ways to get the 2.5 in the Impreza. So um, I just was saying how important it is to have that engine because the two liter in this platform is fine, but it's no better than that. It needs the two five. And when the Impreza was first around, it had two engine options. And then the WRX came and it had two engine options and the WRX. It had a, a two liter, a two five and the WRX. And then after a little while, they dumped the, the bottom engine. But since 2012, when the Impreza was restyled, you've had the two liter at about 148, 152, depending on year. And the WRX, which is 265 to now 271. And that's a huge gap. And I know they're not the same car anymore, but they're so similar. Like it's basically the same. So uh, in terms of size and, and whatnot. So having something kind of split the middle, I think is important because there's a lot of people who want a hatch or want an Impreza or don't need a WRX's um, stiffer ride, engine noise, insurance premiums, but they want a little more power. I mean, I still wish it was at like say 200 and maybe a little turbo, but for what Subaru has 180 plus horsepower, it, it just really makes the vehicle more livable. It's just unfortunate. The manual's gone, mm -hmm. but 
you know, for what it is, uh, I think it's uh, important. And I wouldn't be surprised if the engine expands its way through the lineup over time. Yeah, it, it seems like it would be a thing because the, the fuel economy penalty is minimal, right? And so it would it's make sense. It's one mile per gallon. So, yeah. 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 So I think it would make sense if slowly Subaru just kind of phases out the small engine. And I mean, to expand on that, the two fives in the Forester, it's an option in the Crosstrek, it's in the Legacy, it's in the Outback. The two liters only in the um, in present Crosstrek now, because although it was a different two liter, they increased the size in the um, BRZ. That's a two four, I mean, a different engine. The turbo's a two four. So yeah, it's only being used here. And if people start opting for the bigger one more, I could see them just be like, you know what, save some money and get rid of the other one. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to the other end of the spectrum. So uh, you had a big truck, or sorry, a big SUV uh, recently, and I did too. I had the Mercedes-Benz GLS 584 Matic. So what that means is it's the GLS with the V8, but not the Maybach crazy fancy one. So this is the um, seven-seater version. It well, had so many options added, and it's just, I mean, it's everything you think for the money and for the size. It's just a big passenger spoiler so even the second row has a bench yet the outboard seats have heat ventilation power and massage still which not many benches i think have that it could be the only one and they're fully comfortable the third row fits adults uh, it is up on a bit of a perch and i mean i would want to be back there a long time but it's pretty good uh one downside is to get to the third row it's power operated so there's a button on the uh middle seat and you push and the seat like just slowly moves and tilts forward and you're waiting forever and if you're in a hurry or if it's raining or something that it kind of kind of sucks like oh there's a way i can just throw it up maybe maybe there's a manual override but i wasn't gonna start fiddling around i'm pretty sure just that button mm -hmm. um, as far as the the ride goes i mean it's what you expect i've had a bmw x7 and the grand wagoneer l recently so Again, those are like two different ends of that. And I would say this is like right in the middle in terms of everything. In terms of comfort, not as cushy as the X7, but not as truckish as the Grand Cherokee. Um, the engine too, like it it gives you this great V8 sound, but when you're in sport, it doesn't give you the crazy noise and pops and cracks that the X7 does, but it's always just there. And yeah, it's just a good like refining. Like if you want the best Mercedes SUV, you're going to, get what you're paying for basically like there's a reason it costs so much i mean i'm not gonna say it's a value or anything but uh there's there's a reason compared to their smaller suvs why this is so much more and it can still tow i think 7700 pounds so it can still work if needed that's impressive one one question i have for you because you are becoming the uh the three row luxury suv expert in the last few weeks uh going back like a year um how does this stack up to your land rover defender 130 that you really enjoyed yeah, I mean, that I was wouldn't quite put in the class. It's like a, it's weird because it's not as big as these, but it third row is better than any of them that I've been in. Like, like it's crazy how accommodating the third row is in the one thirty. Because when you look at it, you think, oh, they just grafted on a back, but yeah, it's it's really good. Um, that also is very off roadish. It's sort of mm -hmm. its own niche in its own, but I did really like that. And that one I had with the Turbo Six Mild Hybrid at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so i couldn't really compare it but it's it's like that was like a, an image car that can off-road if you're into that but it's still spacious the thing that i um i like but maybe some people don't like is it's very conservative looking the way the gls's exterior is the x7's very distinct and you see it and you're like oh that's that but some people don't like the look of it um, mm -hmm. I, I haven't warmed up to it yet and then the grand wagoneer has that very sort of jeep you know, rugged look. So this is also great if, you know, you just want to be kind of unassuming and rolling in your your posh SUV to wherever you're taking it. I mean, the cliche, like the country club or whatever. So, yeah. And then the final story from this week is uh, I, I'm i in the midst of a Toyo Celsius 2 all-weather tire test. I got these put on in the fall and my goal is to go all year to see if all weather really works. So, you know, testing in the snow and in the cold, see if the rubber holds up. And then in the summer, see if it gets too squishy in the heat or starts to um, disintegrate like winter tires will. Mm -hmm. The problem is we, as we've mentioned a couple of times on this show, we haven't had winter. So 
There was one point where we had a slush storm that gave us maybe an inch of slush. So I tried it in that. And then we had that snow where maybe we got two inches or three, and then it all melted within 12 hours. But I got out there before it did. Um, so initial impressions in the wet, these tires are amazing uh, because they're like an all season, but with even more of the sipes and grooves to channel the water. I was surprised mm -hmm. how well they corner and break in the wet. In the slush and snow, the braking and accelerating, you can notice there it's lacking a bit compared to a snow tire. Um, a lot of that's because it has full grooves like a, a all season does as opposed to just the staggered blocks, um, which makes them not as loud as a winter on the road, but still a bit louder than an all season. But the lateral grip in the snow was as good as winters. That surprised me. Um, and, they, and they've designed sort of three segments to it. And one segment's meant for that. And yeah, it works now. That was snow where the tire was pretty much brushing it out of the way and getting to the pavement. So I'm hoping at some point this year we get real snow and I can try it on hard pack snow and see how they are. But so far, so good. So my next update hopefully is a snow update. And then my last one will hopefully be summer, but we'll see. I might have to go over a year if I need to wait till next year for snow again. All right. Well, that wraps up our reviews. Uh, we'll move on to the news of the week. We don't have quite as much as normal, but we'll cover what we got. So first one is we finally got pricing for the Polestar 3. Um, it's about, I think, what it was expected. But the big news is Polestar is incentivizing customers with a huge $7,500 incentive, which is basically to make up for the rebate you don't get from the government because of its price. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, and I think it's only if you lease, which makes sense because then they'll be able to resell it later and probably still hold its value. But mm -hmm. yeah, nothing really big there, is, like I said, in terms of what it is, but it's nice that they're offering that incentive because this this will be the volume seller for Polestar for sure. It will be. I mean, it's, it's the right size for North American markets. It's pricier, but I mean, Polestar is a premium brand, so they're going to be targeting that segment and this is where everyone is playing now so I, I think this is a really clever move i'm not entirely sure how long it's going to last but at least mm -hmm. off the bat this is a really great way to get eyeballs on a new vehicle and sticking with electric suvs so rivian has somewhat teased the r2 this isn't the r2 if you're watching if you're listening don't worry you're not missing anything it's just a picture of an r1 They've given us nothing other than a date, which is March 7th. Now, everyone knows the R2 is going to be a smaller, more affordable SUV. There's, uh, you know, apparently a $70,000 point that it's supposed to be around. So it'll be interesting because the R1S and the R1T are fantastic, but they're also playing in that high-end market. But if they can bring this in against the, the usual luxury SUVs and the Model Y and whatnot, um, yeah, I'm curious to see what, what it's like. Mm -hmm. Me too. I uh, I drove the R1S about a year ago and really enjoyed it, but it was also a quad motor. Or, or, yeah, and it was it was the top tram. It had everything, and that's great. But yeah, you're looking at a solid six-figure vehicle at that point, and so it's not really approachable. And with the EV9 now landing for Kia, that's really pushing people to, to look at the three-row EV segment a little closer. I'm not sure if this will be three-row. I don't think... Rivian has said one way or the other, uh, but either way, I mean, moving that price down gives them an opportunity to sell more, get more attention, and yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. And then our last uh, EV in the news is the new Taycan has been unveiled with a lot of power. Yes, although uh, I haven't. If I'm if I'm remembering these details right, Mike, the uh, that that headline 938 horsepower is only available in a specific mode, correct? Yeah, but I mean that's what everyone's doing, and everyone advertises that. We went on on about the EQE AMG and same thing. It's like 677 everywhere, but it's like six what 07 or 617 if when you're not in the boost mode. But mm -hmm. but yeah, that's just to launch and accelerate. And clearly, Porsche's developed better tech and learned and also they're probably going after the plaid to a degree it doesn't have as much power but it wasn't far off it before so i wouldn't be surprised if this will outrun a plaid no and i think the 
benefit here is that it's a Porsche, so it will handle like a Porsche, and it has brakes that will help it stop like a Porsche, unlike a Plaid. Um, I'm I'm excited for it. I, I saw the colors too when they launched, and uh, props to Porsche for bringing out a lot of interesting colors for this facelift, including a really nice uh, a purple that's called uh, Provence. So yeah, yeah. they they've never been afraid of color, which I like too. They always have some cool ones, and I mean. Mm-hmm. They had, we don't know the full details, but they publicized that Nurburgring record that absolutely smashed the old ones. So, you know, those aren't usually fully stock cars, but if it's anything close to that, it, it should be a blast. Mm-hmm. And then moving down the price point, uh, the <laughs> Kia Carnival debuted just yesterday. Uh, the 25, a van that uh, we had not too long ago, and we compared to the Pacific Hybrid, and we preferred the Pacifica, and some of the reasons were interior design and there was no hybrid option while those have both been addressed um and the exterior's actually been refreshed and looks even more suv like and i really like what they did so yeah i'm really i'm really looking forward to trying this out being a, a minivan aficionado uh i think um i think the v6 will still be good but i think with that hybrid it could be a really good vehicle mm-hmm yeah that's that's always been my major complaint about the carnival is yeah, it looks good. It was smart to give it a little bit of SUV feel for, because that's what everybody wants these days. But the powertrain just kind of existed, right? It was just a V6. I, I haven't seen, because I've been on the road, which I'll talk about in a minute, but I haven't seen if this will now have all-wheel drive. Is, is that the case, or is it still strictly a front drive only kind of setup? It's still front drive, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that's fine. Uh, the, currently, the only one that does hybrid and all-wheel drive is the Sienna. So I'm, I'm glad that the Carnival is joining the fray with an electrified option. Yeah, um, it has the 1.6 turbo uh, hybrid setup. So I think they're saying about 242. So similar to what's in the Tucson and the, um, I'm going to mind blanks, Sportage or Sportage, gotcha. sorry. Gotcha. Um, I'm just looking. Uh, I'm looking up for you. Uh, it doesn't say if it's front or all so i might be wrong but i'm pretty sure it was only front if it's all that'd be better but i don't think they're going to put that in i do notice uh again for those listening they can't see it but you could google the, the image of 25 carnival it has a very family look now to the telluride and the ev9 so they've really drawn it in more as to the suv look like this could have the door handles at the back and it would just look like a, a long suv so yeah they're really trying to trying to play it up as not a minivan which they've always tried to market it but it's a minivan yes and especially uh the new facelifted sorrento has pretty much the same face Mm -hmm. all right so we are going to take a break and we'll have a word from our sponsor again and when we come back we will be talking to mazda about the all-new cx70 so stay tuned ebay motors is here for the ride do you remember your first car I sure do. I was fresh out of university and I wanted nothing more than a car. So I went to some dealers with two things in mind. I wanted a two-door coupe and I wanted a manual transmission. After looking around, I finally ended up with a 2003 Oldsmobile Alero coupe with a five-speed manual and a four-cylinder engine. A lot of people didn't understand why I bought that car, but I loved it. I would take it everywhere. I also wanted to modify it. I put a lot of parts on that didn't work. I put on some wheels and they ended up ripping apart my rear brakes and I had to get rid of them. My intake, my exhaust, my suspension, and some interior bits were all custom made. It would have helped so much if there was some sort of way that I could get guaranteed parts for my car back then. Another thing I loved to do with the car was I would take it drag racing. I would do low 15 seconds and thought I was so fast, which I wasn't. But you know what? I was having a blast and I was getting to run the car harder than I was allowed to on the street. I also went to a lot of charity car shows, road trips, and weeks up at the cottage. I had the car for almost two years until one day it was written off in a snowstorm in Detroit by a mail truck. It was a sad day and I really miss that car. One day, maybe I'll get another Alero, but for now, I'll just have good memories of this car and how much fun I had with it. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. 
Okay, welcome back. Joining us right now is John Leverett from Mazda USA, and we are going to ask him a couple questions about their latest vehicle, the CX-70. Welcome. Thanks. Good to talk to you both. Yes. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to this. We're looking forward to the vehicle. Um, we've been in plenty of CX uh, models over the years. I was in a 50 Meridian recently, which I really like that car a lot with the turbo. Yeah, it's nice. Um, I'm actually going to be in a 30 coming up in a couple of weeks. So we'll have that on the show too. Thanks. But we're here to talk about the 70. So um, I guess I'll kick it off. Uh, besides obviously not having the third row in the back, how is the 70 going to differentiate itself from the 90? Yeah, so CX-70 takes kind of a, a sportier approach um, to its styling and kind of its positioning. Um, it'll share powertrains with 90, um, but, um, you know, the front and rear bumper, some of the trim, even the colors option, colors offered on the interior and uh, exterior further kind of differentiate it in that more like sporty um, vein from CX-90. Just a quick question for the next one. Is it, does it have the same rear hatch? Because in the photos I saw, it looked like it was narrower, but is it pretty much the same back there? It is um, very similar. There's there's uh, some painting, some, some trim differences that, that make it appear a little bit different, um, okay. despite the similar dimensions. Okay, gotcha. Interesting. Okay, so that that clarifies one of the questions because we didn't we didn't see it in person. So we're both looking at these things, trying to trying to figure it out. So thanks for that, John. And then yeah. leading sort of sort of related to that then, because it is a, a similar but slightly, slightly different kind of thing, we've been wondering. And so so what does Mazda really consider as as the primary competitor that the CX70 is going to be targeting or competitors? Yeah, so um, you know, when we were planning, you know, we obviously were looking at all over the midsize segment, but also the premium uh, midsize segment. So um, for us, you know, there are several, but I would certainly say um, the Grand Cherokee um, is, is something that we looked at. BMW X5 is a big one. Um, I think people make comparisons between Mazda and BMW all the time, especially with this new platform and inline six. Um, so yeah, keeping an eye on that. And then um, a little bit more mainstream with the, um, you know, the Volkswagen um, uh, Cross Sport. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, we uh, we did an article when you revealed the vehicle. We we kind of guessed as, as to what the not not guessed. Yeah, took educated uh, estimates or, or you know, predictions as to what this would target. We we said X three because uh, yeah, it, it kind of in terms of size, it's it's tough with the BMWs. But um, yeah, we we do see that similarity with the powertrain layout, the inline six and stuff. So yeah, thanks for for answering that one for us. Yeah, I didn't definitely. make a Grand Cherokee until you said it. We also thought uh, Lexus RX, just the two row midsize, there's some similarities there too. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, you know, pretty consistently for us, Lexus, Acura, um, you, you know, there, there are several brands that we're always looking at, um, but we, we, we certainly want to stay unique in what we mm -hmm. offer. And we kind of think we have a unique positioning with the Mazda brand right now. So we're not really trying to be anybody, but we do keep up with, you know, those ones I just mentioned and certainly Lexus and Acura, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is going back to something you mentioned earlier uh, that they're sharing the powertrains, which was in the release. Can you confirm that the CX-70 will have the two states of tune for the turbo like the CX-90 does? No, not at, not at launch. Um, it'll just okay. have the high power and the plug-in hybrid. Okay. Interesting. Which I guess plays to its sporty uh, demeanor that you're talking about. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally have no qualms about that. Uh, I think, Mike, you drove the, the lower power uh, last year because we've driven all versions of the CX-90, uh, but I've driven the, the plug-in and the high power and, and I'm a huge fan, so thumbs up yeah, for me the, on that one. I took the low power on a camping trip with my son and yeah, I mean, it, it was fine. I, do I miss the power? Of course, but that's because of us and who we are, but um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I can say the... Um, the regular 3.3 turbo will be coming later this year, um, just not at launch. So there will be all three on offer uh, towards the summer, but right now just the high power and plug-in hybrid. That's that's great to know. I'm just gonna uh, check out for a moment while I type that up. No. <laughs> 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 so th 
Thanks, John. That's that's good to know and good to hear. Um, moving in a bit of a different direction, uh, moving away from the powertrains, uh, we were some of us were were pretty surprised to see just how ninety based the CX seventy is. So had Mazda ever really considered bringing you know the Euro market CX sixty or or even a modified version of that? When when was it really decided upon that it would be a ninety based product? Well, in terms of like being based on something, 60 and 90 are the same platform. Um, they both offer the same engine options. Obviously in Europe, there's a few different things in terms of diesel that we aren't gonna get here, but same rear wheel drive platform, generally the same engine options, that same plug-in hybrid option that we have here. So, you know, versus being one or the other, it's 90 base is 60 base, 60 base is 90 based. Uh, but, um, you know, CX60, is a as a europe focused model and were we to bring it over here um i think there'd be some disappointment in the actual size um considering the other vehicles that we have on sale that are already similar to it in size hmm. um so when it came down to it um we wanted to prioritize having a large vehicle like a large two row which is something that americans really want and uh it just started to make a lot of sense of well we've got 90 this is a large vehicle um, this, this is, this is what makes the most sense for what the American consumer wants, especially when you look at space. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I don't know the exact dimensions of the 60, but yeah, I could see if it's close to the 50, then you're kind of on top of each other at that point. Right. Yeah. I think, I think CX 60 may appear larger in photos and it, and it certainly has, you know, the presence and like the proportions that make it look really nice and, and maybe a little bit larger, but in terms of the interior, it would have been not not too much different from what we already have. Hey, while we're talking about interiors, that segues to my next question. So, I mean, the last many Mazas we've driven have had that consistently really nice interior in terms of both style and materials. You've switched, uh, you're starting to switch products to this rear drive inline six platform. Um, what else do you think Mazda needs to do or, or is going to do to continue the March sort of up market? Because I mentioned earlier, you're trying to, you know, go against the be unique, but the BMWs and the other premium brands. Yeah, well, I think I don't think you can ever have too nice of an interior. So we'll keep improving there <laughs> and making that even nicer. Um, also, uh, just in performance, you know, the, these inline six engines, this is the first, obviously a first for us. And this is also just our first step with it. You know, expect more to come um, in terms of performance. We want to kind of grow that threshold. Obviously, with EV coming down the road, um, the EV does provide some easier ways to boost power because <laughs> you've got that instant torque um, and and you know the high power capacity of those electric motors. Should we decide to do that? Um, and you know, I'd also just say, yeah, uh, just the general, yeah, the performance in general um, from from our handling. Uh, Mazdas always, have always handled well. They're going to continue to handle well, um, but we want to push those limits even further. Um, so I, I think kind of for us at this point, it's, you know, keeping our consistency high and just keep doing what we've been doing at an even higher level. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of success with that, especially this past year, just um, kind of doubling down on the things that we're good at, which is like you said, that interior quality, the interior design, um, making sure our cars still handle like a Mazda. And uh, if we keep doing those things well um, and further refine them every every generation or so, um, I think we'll get to where we want to go. All right. Excellent. And uh, thanks, John, for, for that explanation. And slightly related, I, I want to talk about, you know, this, this, this March Up Market. I want to talk a little bit about Meridian Edition. I mean, Mike already mentioned it's, he thinks it's the best. And without, we know the future product thing. We don't want to, we don't want to grill you on that. Uh, but without talking about future product, can you maybe talk a little bit more about where Mazda sees, sorry, Mazda uh, sees Meridian Edition, and and you know where that can really play into, you know, the approach that Mazda has. Yeah, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much hope um, because I also love the Meridian Edition. But I would look at. Um, how carbon addition played out for us in our vehicle lineup. Um, we saw it on CX-5 first, and now it is on 
CX30, Mazda 3, it was on CX9 before CX9 was, was discontinued. We saw a lot of success with that um, addition. And any anything that we come out with, we have somewhat of a cross car line mentality um, if it is successful. So it's not to say that we have any immediate plans, um, but with CX50, you know, we're still ramping up production on that vehicle. Um, and we've tweaked Meridian Edition a little bit um, in terms of, you know, maybe features that our customers wanted that it didn't have or something like that. Um, so we're continuing to kind of refine it on CX-50 before we may fully roll it over to something else. But I can definitely tell you that that is, um, you know, we're talking about it um, on multiple vehicles. So we'll see, but nothing is confirmed yet. Yeah, I mean, I could see it rolling out, but like you said, you um, you want to make sure it's the right fit because some vehicles maybe it, it won't be good on, but... Yeah, we look forward yeah. to hopefully seeing it show up. Yeah, and you know, it's it's been a little bit of a surprise for us. You know, we are not, you know, we're 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 known for, like I said, driving like a Mazda or handling that hasn't really translated to off road prowess, <laughs> and we're not really known for that. Um, but CX fifty has certainly helped us, you know, get that in road, and that is something that's really popular right now. So, um, if we if we do it, like you said, it has to be applicable to to the right model. And and still keep the Mazda ness intact. So I shouldn't hold my breath for a Mazda three Meridian with a five inch lift and thirty three inch uh, mud tires on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't hold don't hold your breath for that. But hey, you know, Porsche nine eleven, the the Dakar <clears throat> uh, Rally Edition. Yeah. You know, who knows? Who knows what could happen? It's it's going to everything now. Yeah, yeah. I drove that. It, it is. That's a crazy car. So anyway, that's all the questions. We, we thank you for having you on. Um, I'm actually in a MX-5 next week. Again, nice. supposed to be a winter test, but this season and years isn't working with me. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. But, uh, but anyway, MX-5? Look, yeah. Nice. MX5. Yeah, I guess it's 2024, so, so the, new, the new updated one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm... Um, I look forward to that. And again, thanks for joining us and giving us a lot of info. We look forward to the 70 when it hits the roads and we get to try to drive it. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of comparisons to be made. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, we're looking forward to you guys getting it and, and seeing the reviews come in. So thanks for uh, setting us up. It was good to talk to you both. It was great. Yeah, thanks thank you so very much. much. Yeah. Okay, so it's just Kyle and I again. That was pretty good um some interesting details on the cx70 i mean there's only so much they can tell us but some stuff we didn't know mm -hmm. this is the portion now where we talk about um reader or viewer or listener comments questions what have you so last week we had the question what vehicle do you want a performance version of and um one of the people on youtube luke O, said what i actually had as my backup after the um vehicle I picked. He wants a Maverick ST with the big turbo, um, maybe 2.7 in there or something, or pumping up the 2.3, uh, maybe the old um, Focus RS 2.3. So yeah, I mean, I'm fully on board. I think that would be really cool too. That was sort of my second, because I figured that's a more niche market, but a, a proper compact performance truck pickup with like a rear wheel bias, all wheel drive system. That'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. That would be a blast. Yeah. Um, and then other things we talked about last week, we had the news bit on the V8 Mustang that generated a lot of discussion, um, mostly about people who say they'll be angry if the Mustang goes to all electric, others saying electric cars shouldn't exist. Um, but the general consensus is the Mustang isn't probably going to go anywhere for quite a while, um, if at all. But we all figured that the V8's days are numbered. It'll be legislated out of existence one day, but not anytime soon, at least. Yeah, yeah, and we, it, we yeah, we talked about it last night and or last week, sorry. And yeah, Ford, I, I totally believe them that they will build it for as long as possible. Uh, but yeah, at some point, legislation in North America, especially well, and in Europe. I mean, the Mustang is sold in Europe, but I can't imagine the V8's going to last very long over there. Yeah. And then our other big topic was F1. We spent a lot of time on it last uh, last podcast. So some discussion around F1 has really been how 
invested people think Cadillac is and if they really have a chance. I think if they fully invest with the right engineers in like a full racing department, when the um, regulations change in 26, they'll even have three years to work on it because it, they're not going to be allowed in until 28 at the earliest if they ever are. They could come in with a, a decent setup. Um, some people think Andretti and Cadillac aren't serious enough or they have no hope. Maybe it's unfair because of how Haas has been. Um, but they've been competitive at times, but they don't have the same sort of backing. That's why they mm-hmm. always need a, a big sponsor. So, yeah, I, I I I wouldn't discount their application or how it would be. I mean, are they going to win in the first year or two? Probably not. But I think they'll be at least fighting in that mid pack soon if they if they ever make it. Yeah, I I agree. I think there's. It's unfair to to base the prediction on the existing American team when Andretti and Cadillac are a very different proposition. And and so, I mean, hopefully we see if that happens down the road. But yeah, I, I think solid mid-pack is, is totally doable for a brand with that amount of clout behind it. Yeah, me too. So that brings us to the last section of the week sort of what's been happening and what's next. So Kyle, maybe you can explain why you're sitting in the back of a car. Yes, yeah, so uh, for people who are listening, I mean, you you, you don't see this, but for anyone watching the video, I've been sitting in the back of a vehicle this whole time and that's because I am on the road and I have been all week because a handful of fellow journalists and I, we took on an adventure this week and we drove up to Nunavut uh, in two Toyotas. And so for listeners who aren't aware, that's the third territory of Canada. It is up north, above Ontario and Quebec. We drove about a thousand miles north of Toronto to get there. And then we're we're on the way back right now. So I am in North Bay. I'm still a couple of hours outside of Toronto and I'm calling to do this. And I don't really wanna give away a whole lot of details about this adventure, but it's been fascinating. And as Mike and I have already talked about on this, winter has not been all that this year. And yeah, that's uh, that's applied even this far up north. Yeah, I too was away for a chunk of this week. I was in Steamboat, Steamboat Springs, uh, Colorado. I flew out there to do the Bridgestone Winter Driving School. So that was, it was interesting and it was good. I, I had a, a great time doing it and the whole sort of trip out there. Just like you said, it was in the fifties, the day we were out there, which is unheard of uh, at that area this time of year, but we're just in this crazy warm snap right now. There's a full review and a sort of uh, v- uh, vlog based video coming for that. So look for that probably early next week. Um, and since I've been back for a couple of days, I am in a Land Rover Defender. As Kyle alluded to earlier, I really like the 130 with the Turbo 6. Uh, I've liked the 110 with the Turbo 6. So right now I'm in a 110 with the V8. And uh, I haven't driven it much, but it's 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 pretty ridiculous. I mean, the best way to describe it is you think of a Wrangler 392 and you think of a AMG G-Wagon. And this is exactly like right in the middle in terms of everything. Um, and price wise and sort of position wise, that's what it should be. You know, it's, it's more posh than a Wrangler. It's more rugged than a G wagon. It's yeah. The, the only thing I, I wish I could have more of, um, and it's just me is there's no like button to open up the valves and exhaust. I wish I could just make it loud all the time, but, um, I mean, they could just go to their friends over at Jaguar and borrow their exhaust, but yeah, yeah. yeah, It still sounds good when you're on it. It's just, yeah. But you know what? It's, it's starting to win me over. I thought the 130 with the six was the best package, but now I fully get the appeal of this. Um, it's obviously the most expensive and the worst on gas, but in this kind of vehicle, it just fits the personality. That's that's fair. I understand that. I, uh, I'm i going to be coming home and hopping into a Buick. And I didn't really think I'd be saying this uh, heading into 2024, but I'm, I'm really excited to drive a Buick. Um, it's the Buick and Vista. It's their... Is it? I, I guess it is their entry level model. Uh, it's priced very yeah, close it, it, with the Encore GX. It's bigger than the GX2 slightly, but it is mm-hmm. slightly lower priced because the yeah. GX has the all wheel drive and it's a little more upmarket. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, I'm 
kind of jealous too. I mean, I I really like the tracks and I was at the launch of the Invista and I liked the look of it a lot. So um, yeah, I'll, I'm curious to see what you think of it and we'll have to throw in a comparison down the road. It's just, I don't even know what it competes with. It's such a unique vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Who else has something that that's affordable or that is that affordable while also being a, a semi upmarket kind of Kind of vehicle i'm fine with it being front drive only i had no issues with the tracks being like that yeah and i'm i'm actually going to be taking it to a wedding and looking at the vehicle i'm just like you know what that's gonna that's gonna look really good i'm 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 genuinely excited to drive it so i'm i'm looking forward to getting home and yeah you'll hear about it uh, soon i mean it won't be as cool as rolling up in a land rover no it'll be a fun car and your um, exhaust tip's probably not rusting already like mine is which is really weird but and if i anyway. happen to be late i won't uh upset the ceremony with the exhaust noise. <laughs> with your, your supercharged v8 growling the big wine coming off of the the um supercharger anyway um yeah. moving on to sort of next week i will be driving a mystery car only because uh like happened a couple weeks ago the car is supposed to pick up um is unavailable so i'm looking for something and I might have something tracked down. So I'll let you in more next week. And next week is the Toronto auto show. So yes. uh, I'll be attending that. And there's actually a surprising amount of news that is going to come out of it. So oh, we should have some more details next week on that too. Mm -hmm. And Where are you sadly, going, I am going to be missing the Canadian auto show, which makes me uh, yeah, a little bummed because it's a really great show. It's excellent for consumers, but it's also, I mean, it's a, it's like homecoming for the Canadian contingent, right? Everyone's there. We get to see everyone again, find out what everyone's up to, but I am going a little warmer. I'm heading to Portugal to drive various BMW and mini vehicles. Uh, I, that's all I can really say right now but there is a whole lot of stuff and I will be getting home in time to check out the show at the tail end of the week because I, I never want to miss it. It's the local yeah, show. Well, it's, it's fantastic. Got a whole week and a half when you get back and you know, I'm sure you'll be able to dry your tears for missing the auto show with your five-star Portugal, Portugal restaurant napkins. So <laughs> don't, I'm, I don't feel sorry for you at all. That's uh, fair. Yeah. So anyway, like I said, next week we should have uh, quite a bit of news and we'll talk about some more reviews and, uh, what both of our experiences were with our events. Um, Kyle will probably mm -hmm. have more to talk about than I will, but Maybe a little he bit. may be very jet lagged as well. And um, I think we're going to have a special guest from Cadillac next week. Exciting. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you next week and um, have a good one. Thanks yes. for listening. Thanks for listening to the Autograd Show brought to you by eBay Motors. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thank you once again for listening and watching The Auto Guide Show, brought to you by eBay Motors. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Your elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a driveway entirely its own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply.